Hello, spooky friends. Today, we are going to be bringing the Bride of Frankenstein to life. We just need a few more parts, and that means accessories to complement the gown. The 1790s loved accessories. These included reticules, sashes, hair wraps, and decorations, jewelry, muffs, fans, all of this served to trim out a white or neutral gown. To some extent, it even allows you to mix and match accessories and a gown, which can extend out the wardrobe of a simple white gown since white was uh, the most popular color for these round gowns, especially when clothing is still hand sewn and very expensive as it is for me since I am doing silk. I'm not going to go into terribly much detail about all the accessories that I've made for the Bride of Frankenstein cosplay because a lot of them have already been covered in various books like the American Duchess Guide books or they're just fairly simple and don't need a ton of explanation. Also there are some I forgot to film like the sashes and hair wraps but I'd like to focus on a couple elements that I added specifically to this ensemble to make it a little more Bride of Frankenstein. First comes jewelry, uh, mainly a mourning brooch. Mourning jewelry was all the rage during the 18th and 19th centuries. This was a way to remember a lost loved one, a friend, or even a monarch or head of state public figure. I've seen a few that were for uh, Princess Charlotte or King George III, that sort of thing. This could also even serve as a memento mori if you weren't mourning anyone specifically. How this jewelry was worn and the styles of the motifs varied throughout the century. Woven locks of hair and portraits of the deceased were pretty common but there might also be uh, like engraved or painted motifs on, um, on ceramic or that sort of thing. The early 1700s even had jewelry that included skulls and crossbones, which um, just makes my little pirate core heart go love it. In the 1790s, uh, neoclassicism was very popular, so mourning jewelry often depicted things like willows and urns and women in mourning at the graveside. Portrayals of death were pretty gentle and sentimental, more of a lighter and softer side of death. One of the, one of the trends, either for mourning or for secret love, is called the lover's eye, which is worn as a pendant or a brooch. The jewel would hold a portrait of the other person's eye, like a close-up, often to keep it secret who the wearer was either pining for or in mourning for. I really wanted to add a mourning brooch uh, as a historical gothic nod to this ensemble. Even if people at the time wouldn't have seen it as particularly goth or morbid or that sort of thing, uh, today we probably would, at least the majority of people who aren't into either horror or history would be like, that's a little bit weird. But I think it really fits into actual Georgian Gothic apparel. It's as close as it gets to wearing something historically Gothic. I painted my setting with silver gilding paint, which isn't quite as bright as real metal, but it gives the piece some shine. At first, I couldn't find a brooch setting I liked because I got very picky after seeing a reproduction brooch that I fell in love with. So I designed my own in Tinkercad and had it 3D printed. This obviously isn't historically accurate, but since this part is just for cosplay fun and not something I would wear to places where historical accuracy actually matters, I'm okay with that. Regardless of how the Bride of Frankenstein might have felt about her intended mate, I decided to make my historically gothic edition tie in with Frankenstein's most iconic monster.
In the center, I matted a close-up shot of the eye of Frankenstein's monster. Then I used a white pen to write, We Belong Dead, the monster's last words in the film The Bride of Frankenstein. Go! You live! Go! You stay! We belong dead! Ah! Ah! On to shoes. Shoes are a vital part of costuming. If you don't get them at least somewhat right, it can make the entire rest of the ensemble look wrong. And of course, by this point, I had even less chill than before, so I decided I was going to make my own shoes for this, in a sense. My base was a pair of thrifted black flats with a lightly pointed toe. Very short Louis heels with a more pronounced pointed toe would have been more common, but there are 1790s to 1800s examples of shoes that look pretty similar to what I got. However, the vamp of the thrifted shoes was a little low, so I added a false upper to the shoe. I decided to imitate the style of an extant pair of black and green mint shoes. I also relied heavily on Nicole Rudolph's video, How to Make Regency and Victorian Shoes, even if I knew I wasn't going to make this pair from scratch. I patterned the shoe while it was on my foot and cut the pieces out of beetled linen and mint green cotton. I also added a toe made of thin black leather, which I hand stitched to the three layers of fabric. So initially, I was going to do my shoe uppers out of this mint green cotton uh, to match the extant example that I wanted to copy, more or less. And cotton is fine. Um, I'm not sure that it was regularly used in shoe uppers. But I was like, this is a good color and it's inexpensive because I'm just going to be gluing it over the top of these. It's not going to be all that special but then last second I remembered that I actually have this really pretty pistachio green silk uh, the silk taffeta left over from an earlier project that actually um, goes really well with the greens I already have in this and it matches the mitts I made it for general Georgian wear so I decided I'm gonna recut my uppers out of this and it's fine cotton is cheap and I can secure this now the only thing I'm going to have to be careful of is these shoes are already finished and I can't remove the sole for the life of me so I'm gonna have to see how adhesive works luckily I've got the beetled linen on the other side of the fabric to help stiffen the upper so it won't come in direct contact with the silk hopefully but we're gonna we're gonna see we're gonna hope it doesn't bleed through and spot funny I will be testing carefully with some excess fabric first um, before I make that final decision but hopefully hopefully this works because I am about to cut it then the fabric layers are sewn together and bound with some of the green silk binding left over from the robe. The side and back seams found on 18th century shoes are also covered with this binding.
With the upper constructed, I glued the fabric to the shoe base. I used a leather contact cement to attach the pieces to the shoe. Finally, I got to decorate my shoes. My shoes are meant to go with multiple ensembles and occasions, so they won't get the same gothic treatment as other accessories. I was running low on the binding, so I used some of it to create a simple bow on each foot. Then I 3D printed a few bolts of lightning, which I painted with silver gilding paint and enamel and attached a pin back. This allows me to dress up the shoes appropriately for the Bride of Frankenstein, but also wear them normally for regular 1790s and Regency looks. And at last, we come to the most iconic part of the Bride of Frankenstein, her hair and makeup. In about 1796, hair had transitioned from the sort of hedgehog look of the late 1780s towards the tighter, coiffed and short look of the later decade. For longer styles, the hair was pretty heavily curled. Sometimes even it looks frizzy in portraits and the height was achieved with minimal padding. If any of your hair would do that naturally, then you could just do that. And turban wraps that held the majority of it up in sort of this poof on top of your head. The bride is naturally pretty famous for huge hair, which you might say is electrified, inspired by a bust of Nefertiti, which is kind of a must in this costume to be recognizable. But I had to avoid the huge iconic hairstyles of the 1770s. It just does not go with the dress in any historical way. It looks really silly. So I leaned more on the artwork uh, of painter Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun and how the large coifs were held up by those turban wraps. And there's still quite a lot of volume, at least I think, with a hair like mine, to be gotten from those hairstyles. So I kind of leaned on that. There's also a 1796 German portrait that I found where the subject has really big hair with curls just hanging down the back. And I, kind of liked that. Plus, bonus points for being German, which is what we associate Frankenstein and his creatures with, thanks to the 1930s films. This helped me to decide that while I still want the hair to look pretty right with the 1790s, this decade does sort of have a little bit of an anything goes approach, as you tend to see in some transitional eras. People hang on to certain elements of one decade, experiment with others, abandon some parts, and it just depends on your personal taste, wealth, and region for exactly what that's going to do. I started with an Arda Rosie in dark copper red. A lot of people don't know this just from watching the original Bride of Frankenstein film, but Elsa Lanchester was a redhead. She stated that she used her own hair, pinned and styled over a cage, for that famous beehive look. On top of this, I added a small donut made of red-orange linen, patterned from the coiffure beignet in the American Duchess Guide to 18th Century Beauty. I cut down the size of the donut by half because I didn't need it as big, but I still wanted some volume. This donut gets covered up by tons of red wefts curled and pinned over the top of it. I also added white curled wefts stitched in at the temples and pulled up onto the donut for the iconic Bride of Frankenstein look.
The bride's makeup is so iconic that it was hard to change it to fit the very natural styles of the 18th century. This is another moment I had to step away from pure historical accuracy for cosplay reasons to keep things like the eyebrows so I could stay recognizable. But where I could, I kept to historical cosmetics from little bits on Etsy. I'll put a link to them below. After foundation and contouring, I glued down my natural eyebrows with just a simple glue stick and covered them up with concealer. This allows me to get that extreme angle without it looking funny with my natural brows, even though they're very blonde. They still do they still do stick out just a little bit where they shouldn't. In my first makeup test, I tried to use historically accurate burnt cloves for my eyebrows, but somehow on the foundation over my real eyebrows, it turned blue, which was not a great look and necessitated the switch to modern eyebrow powder. Any monster associated with Frankenstein has to have scars. I drew an autopsy scar and the bride's jawline scars with a light gray pencil. Then I went over that with black and red pencil. The stitches get drawn on in black in a little V shape that you can see in some of the glamour shots from the film. Finally, I added a little red eyeshadow along the scar lines so that they look fresh and angry. At last, it's time to add rouge. I'm emphasizing my cupid's bow just a little bit, again for recognizability, but I don't want to get too 1930s about it. It's the final touch to make the Bride of Frankenstein come to life. enjoyed seeing this historically inspired cosplay be brought to life. If you like this, please subscribe for future sewing shenanigans and explorations of gothic history.